All right, what's going on? You listen to King Cam with Jumbe Podcast and Jumbe Means Message. I am glad that you are here uh, with us one more time. Uh, if you haven't, we are on every platform. We're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Amazon, Amazon Music. Yeah, that's a new one, Amazon Music and um, and Fountain. And so we're on every major podcast platform there is, but I am glad that you are here with me one more time to engage into a little bit of information. All right. All right. Here we go. Without any further ado, let's get down to the business. All right. King Cam, nice school session. This is session four. Okay. This is session four. All right. So. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about chapter three of Basil Davidson's Lost Cities of Africa. Okay, this is chapter three, part two, the kingdoms of the old Sudan. But what's different about this one, right? What's different about it? What The question is, what is the land of gold? What is the land of gold? Okay, so, but, you know, of course, most importantly, this, this course is an introduction to African history. It is geared just for you. It's designed to foster a life of learning. Uh, as you can see, I'm always learning something. I'm trying to learn something new every day. There's always room for improvement. And just a little backstory, this week has been pretty interesting. Before I get into the content, um, we had homecoming this week. We had homecoming this week and parades and all the things. And, uh, you know, we dressed up and did all kinds of things. So today is Friday and this is game day. They just had a pet rally. Uh, did I attend? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't go to the festivities today. Uh, I had to prepare for, you know, for you guys. So, but next time, oh, I'm going. I'm going to the event. All right. So, all right. But, um, but yes, this course is an introduction to African history, and it's it's geared for you, and it's designed to foster a life of learning. And now, uh, this course. This session will be once a week, and and also it will go over a few readings on the continent, um, be it black or white authors. So, uh, of course, we were all I always push the pro the pro black authors or the scholars because there are some authors, but they don't they're not scholarly. You understand? So, um, I like the Dr. Ben's, Dr. John Henry Clark's, and many others. Um, we're going to get into those, but there are some authors such as David, David, I mean, Basil Davidson that, um, that, that gives it from a different perspective. Okay. Do I agree with everything he says? No, I don't. But however, he's pretty solid. Okay. But you guys know a few more authors by all means, you can, you can type them or put them in the chat or in the uh, comment and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. And uh, so but somebody asked me a question, are there any other civilizations in Africa outside of Kemet? Yes, there is. Um, I know we do um, focus on Kemet and Kush, but the, but the continent of Africa is vast, okay? And so this book does a pretty good job at that. Uh, it goes into the sub-regions of Africa. Uh, this is based on the UN sub-regions of Africa. You see, um, you have the Northern Africa, Western Africa, Central, Southern, and Eastern. But of course, we understand that the Nile River Valley is 4,100 miles going from like Kenya to Uganda all the way up to the Mediterranean. And it kind of messes this regionalized idea up. But this is how the book kind of subdivides some of that information. And it makes it easy for us to understand. And so and so this book is pretty strong when it comes down to... um. Uh, the regions and there are some hidden gems in this book i was i was caught by surprise last week and and you know and the more i I read this book before i have i read it when i was in college but uh the lost cities of africa i, I read it again and i'm seeing it differently now so let's get into it right so let's recap what was the main idea from last week in chapter three after kush fell according to davison where did the people go do you remember? You can you can comment on that. Do you remember from last week? Uh, do you remember what did they go? What did they migrate to? Okay, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, last time y'all y'all caught me slipping. I ain't going to do it this time. See, I'm smart. <laughs> so, 
Uh, what what is or where is the Bilal is Sudan? Hmm? Do you remember? Okay. And what is according to Basil Davidson the old Sudan? Okay. According to Basil Davidson, what is the old Sudan? What is this place? And what was the ancient craft of ironworking? There was a thing. Okay, of course, we know about the stone workers and so on, but there was people that, that, that cast iron and they had a certain set of skills. Hmm? All right, but this time, don't forget our, our objective. We're going to identify and discuss the concepts in the book entitled The Lost Cities of Africa, Chapter 3. And the kingdoms of the old Sudan, what is the land of gold? That is the major question we're going to try to answer. What is this land of gold? Okay, there's some other questions we're going to get into, and hopefully we're going to answer them today, yeah? Okay, so one of the questions is, how were they described by the Europeans? We're not talking about the Europeans now. We're talking about the Europeans that were there, that saw them. And what place was called the land of gold? And what was the means of financing this city? We're going to try to answer those questions today. All right. Now, the Bilal Sudan, or Land of the Blacks, was a term used by Arab traders who wrote about this region. In the chapter, it simply meant west of or western Sudan. And it spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, beginning from the country of Sudan to Mali. That is a lot of space. That's a lot of space. That cup that you can put the United States in there and still have room. That's how large this, this place is. Okay. Now, early West Africa, uh, the Abu Hassan Ali Al uh, Masudi, he wrote about in his book, the Book of Golden Metals, he mentioned the migration patterns from East Africa to West Africa. He said that they marched towards the setting of the sun. That's what he said. He said in his book, or his observation, they marched from the middle of the Nile region over to Niger, to Lake Chad, and onward to the setting of the sun. And who were some of these people? In modern times, in modern times, they're the Mandinka, the, Bam, the Bambara, Songhai, and who else? Uh, Dogon, Dogon people, Fulani the um, Hausa, and the Tuareg, okay? That's the major groups that I, that I, uh, that I uh, learned and I picked up on. There's quite a few others. There's quite a few others. I know that there are some others, but, and, and my question is, um, what are some other ethnic groups in the area? Hmm? Y'all can put, y'all can comment that. Uh, what are some other ethnic groups in the Bilal of Sudan? Okay, I mentioned Mandinka, the Bambara, the Songhai, uh, Dogon, Fulani, House of Tuareg. Of course, uh, some of my modern ancestors are Hausa, and some of them are Fulani. Okay, it's pretty cool. So this is pretty personal. And, uh, you know, I'm very excited in sharing this information. But what are some of the other ethnic groups in the area? Y'all can tell me. All right, now, but the question is, how did the Europeans describe them? How did they how did they describe them? What did they say? Let me see. According to Bates of Davison, there was a guy uh, on page 71, a British author named James Bruce, who saw the wars of the Malali Sudan in the 19th century. And while he was traveling, this is what he said. He said, each warrior, this is page 71, each warrior's quarters or house had ha uh, hanging there a steel shirt of mail. And beside it, a soft antelope skin to cover it from the dew of night. A headpiece of copper without a crest of plumage was suspended by a lance above the shirt of mail. The horses were all above 16 hands high. Okay, 16 hands high of the breed of the old uh, Saracen horses, all finely made and as strong as our coach, our coach horses, but exceedingly nimble. OK, but get the, this is how he described what they looked and and what they had. So they had some stuff. He They had some things they had this. Remember, we talked about the iron iron maker. So they had the iron mail on them. 
Okay, but it, you know, it was evening time, so they put their stuff up. But of course, you know, uh, the British didn't believe him. Okay, he didn't believe him. And even though Bruce encountered them in the 19th century, nobody believed them. Nobody believed this guy. And get this, this wasn't new. They've been around, uh, they've been around this area and active hundreds of years before this. Now it may have been new to the Europeans that was alive during this time. But that's none of our concern, okay? The the Africans in Africa have been active for a very long time. And they've been prosperous for a very long time before the involvement of the European. Let that sink in. We talking about a world before Europe or the European involvement. All right now, get it. This is the 19th century, so I'm sure there was other skirmishes happening. I'm sure there was the War of Roses, and there was uh, what else? Uh, the Revolutionary War. There was uh, French Revolution. So many other things that was happening. But in Africa, when he wrote this information in the 1770s, he said, "Bro, these people are different out here, but we've been different, huh? You know, so." There, were, there was trade in North Africa. According to Davis, throughout the Middle Ages, commercial treaties were made. They linked North Africa to the Norman merchants of Sicily for centuries. Now, Christian states established consuls or, or in the southern port. So they were able to trade to and from the northern regions of Africa into the Mediterranean into and throughout Europe. Okay, this is, what Bas uh, this is Davis and what he's saying. However, there's a catch. The Christians were debarred from the interior. Yeah, you can you can post up out here. You can you can do that, and you can you can you know you can do you, you sell your stuff and all this kind of thing. But you can mm -mm, you can't you can't cross this line here. There was their rules. Remember, these people were sovereign. These people, they had the power. What are you gonna do? Kick their door and say, you better let us do this. Mm, no, they won't be smart, right? So they were, the Christians or the Europeans were barred, uh, debarred from the interior. Now, but how did they get to the trade routes? Because they, they was able to figure out a way to do this. How, do they, how were they able to do that? They had a map or atlas called the Catlin map of 1375. They had a Catalan map of 1375. This, keep in mind, this is, uh, of course, this is um, uh, uh, this is October. Uh, some people celebrate Columbus Day and what have you, and all this kind of thing. This was a hundred years before Columbus, uh, so called. He discovered. Uh, he so called discovered the Americas. So there was already a map being in 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 real heavy rotation, the Catlin map. This atlas showed the mountains of Morocco. Hmm. A map. This is before GPS, by the way. <laughs> a map showing the mountains of Morocco. And now, if they went further south, there's a broken by a pass used by merchants going to get this. They call it the land of the Negroes of Guinea, the land of black people in Guinea. Think about that is the that is the sign or title in the southern part uh, below that uh, the Mor Moroccan mountains saying this here. Once you get past this area here, it's the land of the Negroes of Guinea. That is um, that to me. I, I don't know about you, but for people to put that title there, say, "Hey, this here, this place." However many miles there is, is ran by this group of people over here. Let that sink in, y'all. Amazing. And so the Great Southward Route by way of a place, it was by way of a place called uh, Sigilimasa. Sigilimasa. And on the atlas, it identified other places like Timbuktu, further south, Timbuktu, the Sita, uh, 
C to uh to C to tat the Mali, okay, or the city of Mali. Uh C U Tat the Mali, the city of Mali, Gao and to Gaza. So these southern places in the Guinea, there was basically a region, and they were Timbuktu was identified, Mali was identified, Gao and to Gaza. With the Catalan Catalan map of 1375. Remember, I said the guy in 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 Britain uh, tried to um, identify these people, and he he said how they lived, and he said what was happening, and the Europeans of the 19th century in Britain said, "No, that can't be true." However, there's a map that's a hundred years before that that's saying that it is true, but you know. Sometimes it's it's hard to believe until you see it for yourself, right? Let's go, let's go further. Now, so we did the land work, right? We talked about the the routes, some of the routes, uh, the exp uh, explorations on the Gatlin map and the atlas and how they went to and fro and how they did everything and and all of that. Okay, but check this out: they weren't just traversing land. They weren't just going on horseback or via camel or whatever uh, across the land. They were going across the water, too. Hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean, King Cam? What do you mean they was going across the water? Okay, okay. I got you. Hold on. Okay, Amari, in his book, Masalik al Basad, suggested the Atlantic voyages were made by the mariners of West Africa. It was happening. Now, Basil was trying to kind of make light of it. You know, he's called it a tall story on page 74, but it is a fact. It is a fact. These people were going from the Atlantic, uh, from the from the uh, west coast of Africa onto the east coast of the Americas. And they was doing it for a long time. Okay, if they was able to, to, to traverse the Sahara, okay, and, into the... Uh, the, the Sahel region and so on with no problems. They, I'm sure they can traverse water, right? And so West Africa sailed the Atlantic long before Columbus, okay? And in times of the emperor, Kanka Masa Musa Mali, it, it, it was the thing. And then it, and it says so here, uh, Amari mentioned the words of Ibn Amir Hajab, okay? Talked about the the discoveries and how the king wanted to discover worlds beyond this. Okay, he took out 200 ships, 200 ships and filled them with men and another uh, such, according to the book, filled with gold and food that would last them for two years. And he told them to come back when you run out of food or till you find something. And according to a single ship did come back. Okay, this is this this was happening, and they and they, they said they found the Sultan said uh, we sailed for a long while until we until we met with what seemed to be a river with a strong current following flowing in the open sea. That was the North Atlantic uh, drift. Hmm. So they was able to hit a highway in the middle of the ocean. Hmm. And this is before everybody else. Now, here's the thing. They, they did migrate. They did travel. And they did do all these things. But the, I now, do, my question is, yeah, the Europeans didn't believe them. But do we believe that? Do, do, can, can we believe that we have achieved all these great and wonderful things at one period of time? I know looking around at our situation and our condition, it may be um, sad or it may be discouraging, but it can be done and we can do greater and uh, we can do more and, and greater things. That's what I believe. Okay. Now we have some scholars too. Okay. Now we heard about the works of Leo Africanus and many other um uh, Arab scholars, but we had West African scholars. The question is, did we have any African, African scholars that gave a firsthand account of the empires of West Africa? Did we have them? 
do we have? That's the question. Yes, we have. We've heard about that. And so uh, the West African scholars like um, Abderan Es Sadi, uh, Tariq, he wrote a book called uh, Tariq as Sudan. Okay. In his book, he uh, he was a little backstory. He, he was a learned citizen of Timbuktu who was born in 1596, uh, 1596. And he published a book comprising of the of a chronicle of the Sudanese kingdom. So he talked about these kingdoms in vast areas. He gave uh, accounts of uh, the diplomacy that was happening, the princes, uh, short biographies and so on. So that's what he talked about because he lived in that area at that time in Timbuktu, the major hub of education. And he was saying, okay, I'm going to share this information. Out here. Okay. So that's what he said. Now, all right, so another West African scholar, uh, a book called uh, Tariq as uh, Farhash by Mahmoud Kaji, he, he, he focused on the Songhai Empire himself, but itself. But the reason why he is an important figure is because he was held in high regard because he lived during the time when Askia Muhammad traveled to Mecca, he accompanied them. He was with them when he made that great pilgrimage to Mecca and came back. But he also was around when, when the Moroccan invasion happened in Songhai. So his work was just as uh, important. Talked about uh, their great works and the great things that they were doing and have done. Okay? So they they did the work. They were telling us about us, telling the people about us. It may have been in Arabic, it may have been in Wolof, or it may have been in Hausa, or in, even in Yoruba, but the story was being told. The story was being told. All right, now. Let's get down to it. The land of gold. What is this place? What is this land of gold? Okay, we talked, we, we talked about the trade routes, okay, using what? The Catlin map. We talked about the West African mariners moving from, say, uh West Africa into the Atlantic, some coming back, some even inhabited the uh the, the uh the islands and the coast and so on in the Americas. There's plenty of work and plenty of books. Out there, uh, one good one, really quick, is they came before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. That is a good one. Okay, all right. So, but now, what is this? The land of gold. What is this? Now, historian El Fazari named Ghana as the land of gold. Hmm, I wonder why is that? I wonder why he named that. That not, I believe not. I don't think it was not just for the gold deposits of the area. I don't think so. I don't think it was just for because you know in the rivers and the banks they're just digging up gold and it just it was there, right? I think the people lived a golden way of life. Hmm. Not just the gold, the material gold, but there was some, some um, there was some other valuable things and it was in the lives of the people the golden way of life that's what i think golden people hmm. and so and we, we think about the you know um how these europeans was looking for um i, I forget the great city of gold but you're looking for this city that's made of gold and no the people are valuable too. The people are the most uh valued thing. And so they lived the golden way of life. They promoted now, how did they do that? They promoted new forms of social organization. Um, they had this, they, they created um uh, an African feudalism, uh, which was implement implemented as law and custom. Uh they 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 did have uh that there was some Islamic law in place, but there was also a communal sense of living also, some Ubuntu, um, uh, because of 
uh, you are, I am. And it was some sharing going on. And it was, it even matter of fact, um, West Africa was still matrilineal. So a lot of things, a lot of uh, points of view and reference points was coming from the women of West Africa. Okay. Meanwhile, in Europe, in Europe, their women was treated less, less than dogs. But our women in West Africa were handled and esteemed highly. Okay. And so that the people was also the land of gold. And and the currency was knowledge. And and these people, it, it was they had law and order. And and in, in, in the book on page 93, it says this was a civilization in its own right, standing to North Africa in, in much of a time of relationship of influence. Okay, uh, their men show no signs of jealousy. Whatever, no one claims to uh, to be distant from his father, but on the contrary, from his mother's brother. So, um, there were decency there. Okay, everybody had, you know, and El Fazari would later learn that the word Ghana was given as a title for a king. I didn't know that. Huh. So their kings was named, that was their title, like Sadaki or uh um Sultan or many others. That that was their title, or Insit Biti, that was the title. Okay. So El Farzi would later learn that the word Ghana was given to as a title for their king in this place called the land of gold. Not just for the uh, for the gold stuff, but for the golden people. Right, so Abu Bakr, what is this place called Abu Bakr? What is this? What is this? This was the capital of Ghana, Abu Bakr, the capital of Ghana, and it had two cities six miles apart. But in between those cities, there were towns full of covered dwellings. Uh, they not only had a king and a military, they had a dozen mosques there, it was a merchant city, uh, clerics notaries, imams, you name it, they had it. It wasn't just a king with a standing military and everybody threw hands. It was it was a place of knowledge and a place of education. The currency, yeah, they had other forms of currency, but one of their currencies was knowledge. Education is key, right? And so uh, it, now Abu Bakr, Yes, it was the capital of Ghana, but it wasn't far from Kano also. Shout out to, to Kano, uh, which is in the north now is in the northern Nigeria area. But we have to understand that these air, these regions were vast and these kingdoms were great. So Abu Bakr was the uh capital of Ghana, of the Empire of Ghana at the time, and teachers were everywhere. It was just in Timbuktu. It just was wasn't just say in Morocco affairs or somewhere. It was teachers and people of knowledge was everywhere, men and women. Let's be clear, okay. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit more about this place, okay? Um, these people, uh, when El Bakari describes this this king and this kingdom. Um, on page 85, so he says, when he gives his audience his people to listen to their complaints and set them to rights, he sits in a pavilion around which stands his horses uh, and clothed a cloth of gold. Behind him stand 10 pages holding shields and gold-mounted swords. And on his right, on his right hand are sons of the princes of his empire, splendidly clad and with gold plated in their hair. The governor, so there's a king, then there's a governor who is also there, too. The governor of the city is seated on the ground in front of the king, and all around him are his viziers in the same position. The gate of the chamber is guarded by dogs of an excellent breed. Now, here's the thing. Um, I may want to visit the king, but I don't want to visit those dogs. <laughs> no, no, you got it. And so... The king wasn't just king by title. He actually presided and ruled with a concept of law and order and justice. He heard the complaints of the people. When was the last time you, you sent an email to your representative 
and they they not only heard you, but something was done about it. Hmm. You know, I mean, I'm just I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So there were great leaders, great empires, great kingdoms, great kings and queens. Um, Kumbisale is it's the name of few. Um, of course, this this is not just I'm I'm mentioning Ghana here. But it's not 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 only Ghana, but Songhai was uh, was on par with it. Mali was also. It wasn't just say one place at one time. Here's here's an interesting idea about Africa, and um and the empires of Africa. When one empire fell, some others popped up. E almost immediately. Hmm. But when 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 Rome fell, yes, we can deal with you know some symbol symbolism of it and and how other things came out in the West. But no, these actual empires rose and fell and rose again, and and you can see that also in our black neighborhoods in the Americas in in, in the United States. Okay, after slavery, it, it was happening. We had uh, Black Wall Street. We had Queen City in Dallas. We had Frogtown. We had Freemantown. We had Freemantowns everywhere after uh, the emancipation. It was happening. Live in color in the modern age. Okay, so that was that was not just Ghana, but Songhai, Mali, and many other places in that area. It was like a boom. It basically happened almost all at one time all right so the question is what was their means of financing the empire how did they make their money through trade and tariffs yeah you yeah you know we got to make money but we have to understand it wasn't like i tell my my high school students it wasn't say the money that we would think of like the dollar or the or fiat currency uh, they they did they had another way of doing it. It was through commodity. And what was their commodity? What was their commodity at this time? It was gold. It was salt. And I learned this one: copper. I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't know copper was. I knew copper was mine, but I did not know a city called a uh, Wadai, uh, in in Africa, was known for mining copper. Huh. So we had the salt that was being traded from the north and, and the gold in the south, but then copper was in between that. That was their commodity. Other than selling books and knowledge, they was trading. And yes, they no, no one group had complete monopoly over, say, the gold mines, but they with these 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 uh these brothers and sisters had control over the routes. They had control over those those trading routes, and that's the reason why a lot of Europeans tried to bypass um, the Bilal of Sudan and try to go further south and try to wrap around uh, southern Africa into the east, try to get to the Silk Road because they knew that they had to come through Africa and they was not invited, not at this time. But their commodity was gold, salt, and copper. So, just got through listening to King Cam and Jube podcast, and Jube means message. And today's message is Chapter Three: Basil Davidson's The Lost Cities of Africa, Chapter Three, Part Two: The Kingdoms of the Old Sudan and What Is the Land of Gold? All right. So let's recap: Where is the Bilalu Sudan? Where is that? And how were they described by the Europeans? Do you remember? How would it describe by the Europeans? And what place is called the land of gold? Do you remember? You can put it in the comment. What place is called the land of gold? Okay. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. We're out on YouTube and and everywhere. You know, uh, my podcast is everywhere. Thanks to you guys. Appreciate it. And why did El Fazari call it the land of gold? Now we know there was, you know, some reasons, but I want to hear from you. And what was the means of financing this city and this empire? 
Okay. Now, so what's next? Next week, we will finish chapter three because chapter three is hefty. It was out of all the chapters, you know, other chapters were 20 pages, 30 pages. This was 60 plus pages. So I had to split it into uh, chunks because I know that I want the information to be received well and to be broken down. And if you guys have any questions, by all means, uh, you know, ask, right? So we're going to discuss Kenan Barno and Defer. That's the late Chad Niger area, all right? So it wasn't just, like I said, I read the book, but it it's the title is a good one, Lost Cities of Africa. It's going to talk about Kenan Barno and Defer, Defer. okay? It, it's, see, what happens when we think about West Africa, as I mentioned last week, when we talked about the North people, we think about Mali's Ghana, Songhai, Mansa Musa, that's it. Other things, other things was happening. Right? So we're gonna get into it. And then, so, and I I I, I would like for more information on the Belalu Sudan. Check out home team, he's good. Abdullah uh quick, he's really good. Yaya Sabaka, he gives very good uh current event information on it. And AE learning. I know there's so many others names. I, I you know I, if they come up, if they come up, um, I'm going to shout them out because they they're really good. They're really good. Uh, we're all in this together, and we're all learning together to make our place, make our uh, neighborhoods and areas around us a better place. And so, but your homework is to read chapters three and four. Okay, we're going to finish chapter three. I promise. <laughs> so, all right, but. Really quick, we're going to prayers go out for a peace and unity and stability for our family along the Sahel region, the Balalu Sudan. I know there's different tribes, different ethnicities and ethnic groups, but suffering is going on in their area. Okay. Uh, pray for them. Think about them. Um, you know, um, like I said, they, these are different groups, the Tuareg, the Dogon, Mandinka, the Hausa. They may have different customs, but they all are engaged in the same struggle. And that's freedom. All right. And so we just got through listening to King Cam and Jumbe podcast. And in Jumbe means message. And once again, the message is uh the lost cities of Africa. Chapter three, part two, the kingdoms of Old Sudan. What is the land of gold? And uh really quick, this has been brought to you. This has been brought to you by um, Peachy Cam Events and Designs, Pan African, shout out to Pan African Bookstore in Dallas, and the Ellis County African American Museum. Okay, Museum Hall of Fame. And I am the new board president um, for the museum. And so uh, we're going to get some good stuff going, some tours and live sessions. We're going to uh, eventually migrate the podcast uh scene to to the museum and we're gonna we're gonna get in and get down and really handle history as it should be uh handled uh in this area um i'm very grateful and uh you know that's all i have to say and like i tell my students here i'm done saying words and i will talk to you later peace have a good one